Good evening, and uh, thank you. It's such a, um, so nice that you could come. It's such a pleasure to be inside with so many people. That's a little alien it's these days. It's a little days, surreal, right? absolutely. Um, uh, we're, we're, I'm just going to explain the format, and, um, and, then, and then we'll start talking about the book. Um, I thought it would be great if Amanda read to us from the, the, her book, The Lost Boys of Montauk, and she picked a passage, and I don't know which one it is, and then when she's done, I'm going to read back something to her that meant a lot to me within the book that she doesn't know what that is, and then we're going to open it up to a more conventional book talk conversation. Um, over to you. Okay, great. First of all, I just want to say thank you for making the time to be here on a summer, a summer Sunday. So, All right, here we go. This is from Chapter 6, which is titled uh, Mahoneyville. At 15, right around the time he went off to Choate, Dave Connick radically altered the course of his life. A lifelong downhill skier, his family vacationed in Aspen and Telluride each winter, Dave took to surfing with ease. Next, he learned to fish. As a teenager, Dave became a regular presence at Mahoneyville, an epicenter for East Coast surfing. A block away from Georgica Beach in East Hampton, Mahoneyville was a local compound frequented by affluent, wayward young men who generally had way too much free time on their hands. Because he was always so eager and stoked to go surfing, friends started calling him Stoker. While at Mahoneyville, either during the summer of 1976 or 1977, Dave began, began spending more time with Tom McGivern. He was already best friends with Tom's younger brother, Morgan. Tom, who had recently graduated from Choate and enrolled at Harvard, drove Dave out to Montauk when the waves fell flat. And he was the one who introduced him to a friend, a fisherman named Michael Stedman. It wasn't long before Dave caught the fishing bug. Aboard the Marlin 4, Tom and Dave worked as Captain Mike's trusty mates. Sometimes Morgan would tag along with his Nikon camera in tow. At Boston College, Morgan's senior portfolio featured documentary-style black and white photographs of Montauk commercial fishermen hard at work. When friends drove out from the city to Mahoneyville for the first time, one of them would direct the boys accordingly. Take the Long Island Expressway. When you get to the East Hampton Airport, make a right onto Georgica Road. If you can't find Mahoneyville, just ask anyone you see for directions. They will know where you should go to get there. Once out east, city dwellers were always surprised that random passersby did indeed know Mahoneyville's precise coordinates. On the South Fork, during the 1960s and 70s, Mahoneyville was where middle school and high school age kids drank beer, smoked weed, and experimented with LSD for the first time. It was a seasonal affair. Mahoneyville came alive from Memorial Day to Labor Day. The shingled barn painted with a white peace sign contained dozens of O'Neill wetsuits. Surfboards of every size and shape leaned against all available wall space. Bob Marley and Peter Tosh records played on a near constant loop Mahoneyville was a, pri was a primitive, primal scene. It was like living inside a commune while the rest of East Hampton went about its preppy, buttoned-up business. Thank you. For Catherine Cedarquist, the loss of Dave Connick is always present. On March 29th, 1984, Catherine was 20 and living with her father in Manhattan when her doorbell buzzed. It was the doorman asking if her friend Kristen could come up. Minutes later, Kristen sat on the edge of Catherine's bed and told her Dave was missing. Three days later, on April 1st, Marvin Gaye, who had supplied the soundtrack to her love affair with Dave, died in Los Angeles. Catherine felt paralyzed. She didn't leave her father's apartment, not even to go to the grocery store or to her classes at Hunter College, until she made her way out to East Hampton some 10 days later for Mike and Dave's joint memorial service. Catherine and Alice sat together in the back of a limousine. Alice recalled her son's girlfriend with particular fondness. She was lovely, she was beautiful, 
She was real. For years, whenever Catherine ran into Alice, she teared up. Alice and Dave had identically shaped hazel eyes, and it was impossible to look at her and not see her son. When Dave died, Catherine kept most of his clothes. She can still remember the way he smelled. He had the perfect mix of pheromones overlaid with the faintest trace of fish guts. His, ta his skin tasted like salt water. Catherine's drug use, which began during high school after her parents divorced, intensified after Dave's disappearance. In May of 1986, after completing a stint at Hazelton, Catherine walked into her first AA meeting at a nearby fellowship house. By then, she went by Cat. Over the years, she's taken on various nicknames, each one a fresh chapter, a chance to start anew. It's funny, she says, that Dave only knew me as Nana. He only knew me for four years. Dave is frozen in time, forever the 22-year-old first love of her life. Who knows what we would have become? We were just kids. Like many survivors in this story, for the first few years after the wind blown went down, Catherine wasn't entirely convinced Dave was dead. Because of it, she doesn't shy away from death. I've kissed many a dead corpse, Catherine said. She wants to see the bodies of the people she has loved. She needs to touch and to feel them dead. The way the physical body changes shape once the soul resides elsewhere. Her need, practically a compulsion for closure. Thank so, you for reading um, that. Amanda, um, this has been a very closely held story out here. And between your reading and my reading, and the fact that lots of people with us probably know all the names of the, of the, the boys on the boat, um, I think my, I, I want to ask you as my first question, how did this story come into your hands? Um, and I know that it involved a snowy day and a conversation just across the street from where we are now but why don't you start telling us the rest? Okay, very good, thank you for that. So uh, I'm a longtime magazine and newspaper writer, and uh, this book, which has really been my years long obsession, um, began uh, right across the street at the East Hampton Star, where I was working at the time as a staff writer, and an editor there, who we know we share in common, uh, by the name of Biddle Duke. Uh, we were sitting there becoming acquainted with one another, um, and talking about story ideas. And there was a fresh blanket of snow on Main Street, and there wasn't really many cars traveling by. And um, he started telling me sort of the great untold story of this area. And um, he started talking about a fishing boat, and 1984, and these four beautiful young men whose lives were lost on that boat. And it was during the same conversation that he also started talking with me about Mary Stedman, who was the widow of the young captain. Right. And um, it was, I think, just his description of Mary and sort of the cadence of his voice shifted and his eyes widened. And I said, well, why is it that you, you don't want to write this story? It seems like this has really, you know, hit a nerve, uh, clearly. And he said, oh, well, you know, I really think that an outsider has always needed to come along to do the story justice there would just be far too many um, you know, complicated relationships that would arise were he to write the story. So he graciously put me in touch with Mary and the timing wasn't right and a whole nother year would go by and I sort of couldn't let go of something about it. Um, it's sort of a journalist sixth sense, I think, of when there's a really good story to be had. Um, and it, it began as a, as a newspaper story. Did you see it immediately as the good story that Biddle felt himself that it was? Or did it take a little more... It took some time. It took some time. Yeah, I mean, meeting Mary. Mary has a photographic memory, and she we would sit for three and four hours at a time and and talk about you know an afternoon in 1984 with just the most incredible detail that I've ever encountered in a source. And then every time we got off the phone, she'd pass along you know five names and five names after that, and it just started going out in all of these different directions. And I realized that this wasn't really a magazine story, but but a book. And it really wasn't until that same fall, I came out for a reporting trip, and I took a trip out with a friend to the Montauk Lighthouse, and uh, there was a meeting coming out, and you know, I was sort of standing at the gate hoping to get in to go see the Lost at Sea Memorial while I was still here, 
And I said, oh, you know, I'm here um, kind of doing a little bit of reporting about the windblown. And all three of the members coming out of that meeting, which wound up being the lighthouse keeper and someone that runs the historical society, um, said, oh, you mean March 29th, 1984. And it was then that I realized this was a story that wasn't living in the hearts and minds of the people who knew and loved these men, but this was something that was resonating much more broadly. Through the whole folklore of the town. Truly, um, yeah. And in yeah. another way, I, it, it's not really a question, but, but I, I want you to respond to it. Besides the, the very moving personal um, heart of this, which is, which is how these four young men ended up on that boat together, one of whom you are at pains to point out and unpack very carefully, really had no business being on the windblown. He was from a completely different sort of patrician background than to any, anybody that would be uh, typically working in a fishing crew. It's also, it's not just about the loss of the, of the, the, the men at that moment in, in their young lives, but about a moment in East Hampton, which is now gone, and I just can't ever see it as not be as divorced from that context, where somebody that grew up going to Maidstone um, and whose father went to Harvard—that's one of the other ones, right? That's that not was Michael Stubbins' Connick, father. Yeah, um, but he had gone would, to Yale. Would end yeah. up leaving his life as his parents had envisioned, envisioned it, and going to work on a fishing boat. You don't see that out here now, um, with the transformation into a very much more moneyed version of East Hampton that's taken place. But that had just, if, if not yet begun, it was beginning basically right then in 1984 to this place, right? Right. Did Biddle right. talk about that too? We did talk about that and that there was sort of this interesting sort of convergence aboard this one particular vessel where there was this kind of upstairs, downstairs quality where these two super hardworking, you know, fishermen kids, uh, one of whom was a Montauk native, one of whom had grown up farther up island, um, you know, came into contact with exactly that, a, a Maidstone Club kid who thought that there was really not a whole lot of um, worth in, you know, becoming a stockbroker or a lawyer and found a real passion uh, at sea. Um, along with, the, with uh, the captain, Captain Mike, who also came from a radically different background. His father was a diplomat, uh, civil servant with the United Nations, and he had gone to Harvard, and he was a really powerful uh, commanding presence, for sure. And, and, and the, the theme of fathers and sons was something early on that, that endlessly fascinated me, of, of, of what each of these four men were wrestling with, whether their fathers had been absent or, or Why drunk, is that so fascinating or, to you? Uh, dead. Um, I just think we're constantly, as humans, trying to shape ourselves based on our histories and what we came from. And I think there's something particular to fathers and sons and mothers and daughters of this this need to kind of like you know branch out on your own and become your autonomous self. But it's always, I think, commonly in reference to to that who you know who was that raised you. Well, there's another theme that I can't help but identify in your writing, which is. Um, I don't know if I'd call it a preoccupation, but a, a, a very careful examination of grief and the consequences of grief that you seem quite drawn to personally. And uh, besides this book being an exercise in that, I also read an article you wrote in the New York Times about a woman who's um, suffered an incredible um, experience where her children were killed by her um, estranged husband. And you talked about how she manages that grief by free, free swimming in freezing water. Um, which I did with her all which through the you winter. Did, you yeah. did do with her. Yeah. You, and um, well, I just want to ask you, what, where, where is, am I correct in saying that there is an interest that you have as a writer in that? And where does it come from personally, mm. if you'd share that with us? I like that question. I haven't been asked that question. Um, okay, so my pre, I don't know if it's a preoccupation with grief, um, but I've often felt from my, you know, earliest memories that I was sort of an old soul and um, maybe always middle age. So I'm feeling like finally I'm in, in the skin that I've been inhabiting all along um, and kind of surface level. Um, Save that for a question. Yeah. <laughs> I think, you know, sort of surface level um, conversations and examinations are of, real, of very little interest to me, which is probably why I don't write about, you know, lip gloss and um, things of that nature. Um, I'm interested in like the heart of who we are and people that have gone through um, 
tremendous obstacles and persevered and what that looks like. And it doesn't always look like perseverance, right? Some of the folks um, in my book, this was a devastating loss and they never quite could figure out their way out of that. Um, and so it was just so interesting having spent so many years, you know, having uh, I interviewed over 100 people for this book, many- 100 many, people over how many years? Over about two years. Um, many of whom I interviewed multiple times. You know, for, Mary and I have probably spoken for 50 hours, if not more. Um, but you know, after I had just come out of, of, of this work of, of, about you know, conversation after conversation about grief and loss, uh, there were a lot of men that were breaking down in front of me. It was, it was a really heavy book to report, for sure. Um, it's a heavy book to read. It is a heavy book to read. And then it was so interesting to meet Stephanie because I felt like we shared, a, we had a language in common where so many people are so freaked out by that story and they don't know how to connect around it. And I just felt like there was a way in which we could communicate and I could just listen and she could have her, she could share what her experience had been like rather than worrying about what my reaction would be or that she needed to take care of me. Um, I find so often people just want to, to be listened to. Um, I am interested in the structure of the book, and I want to be careful not to ruin it for anybody who's here who's, who hasn't read it yet. So we're, we're, I'm going to allude to certain things, but not complete what, what I'm talking about. Um, the book is what I would describe, and tell me if I'm correct in using this term, as a braided narrative, where you weave in and out of describing the time on the boat and then the personal lives of the people and it's divided into chapters based on sort of biographical information that you want to share about each crew member um, and their families. And um, is that a braided narrative? Is, is, I, I mean, I haven't heard that term, but I like that I'm a term. Writer, but a I, braided I, narrative? I mean, that sounds great. I picked that up Did somewhere. Did I do that? Someone, <laughs> Um, people often describe your work as braided, as, as a narrative. No, I, I, I heard it somewhere, and it is a term, and it, I think it fairly applies to this. So, um, but for instance, Moby Dick is like that. There are sea stories that do that, because you can't just write a linear narrative about a boat and the people on the boat. You have to, do, to hit one and then the other and kind of, you know, mesh them, knit, knit them together. How did you come up with the structure that we are reading when we read the book, in, in the order that we are? How did you choose who to talk about first and last? Yes, so the structure was the absolute hardest part of this for me as, a, as, per, as someone who which, had never- Which I should say in this case yeah. is sort of like film editing. Yes, right, and as someone who had never written a book before, um, you know, I went out and gathered, I think, enough material for three or four books on this topic, to be perfectly honest, and it just ignited this sort of obsessive and quality in me. Well, about fishing and surfing and, you know, golden tile fish and... and um, but, but would the one I'm going to mention be the obvious first one I would ask about The Perfect Storm? Was that a book you read oh, to prepare course. for this? Oh, of course, yeah. I've Captain's read Courageous, would that be another? <laughs> I didn't read Captain's Courageous. I haven't I read, read it either, every but it's a hell of a movie. Every, every other maritime-based book, as my husband, who's in the audience somewhere here, will attest. They just kept arriving to our doorstep. Conrad. Yeah, yes, absolutely. Um... But, you know, the, the structure was the trickiest part. It, it, exactly that is like, you know, where do I, how do I guide the reader along on this journey? One of, one, one of my friends described it that she felt like she was reading a woman's obsession. Like, okay, now we're going to learn about golden tilefish and now we're going to learn about surfing and I might eventually get you back to the main thread of the narrative. That's what and I personally love about nonfiction. Not what, everyone does. What yeah. you read to us, Mahoneyville is the surfing community that, these kids sort of created for themselves in one of the family's houses. Right, at the Mahoney right? compound, yeah. which is right within walking distance from Georgica, very close to and here. They sort of used surfing as a preamble to their fishing careers. As they, they, they weren't gonna be country club kids, so they became surfers, and then when the leisure aspect gave way to them working on fishing boats, one of the parents, at least, of the, of the uh, boys who was lost was very angry about Mahoneyville having been in her mind the start to her son's attraction to life at sea, mm -hmm. right? Alice Connick, you mean? Yeah, right, right. Um, but yes, I think that the structure and the, the braided narrative, I mean, it could have gone in many, it was sort of like a Jenga piece and a puzzle of, of what to put, what, you know, what goes first and what comes next and, and that sort of thing. And I think it could still be rearranged differently and told in other forms in a completely different order. 
And, uh, and also, I mean, it wasn't an exercise in narcissism, which some readers were put off that I inserted myself into the book. But I wanted to explain, you know, in this very insider culture, how this outsider came to find herself in it and how she learned about the story and, you know, what it means. Um, and, and I wanted to take the reader a little bit along and how one source leads to another and how trust builds between a journalist and a source. I mean, this is very much about a, the dance between that yeah, whole I, situation. I really haven't heard anybody talk about the story without it including the story of how you came to the story which is, I think, why I probably thought to make that my first question. The story of how you came upon it, and then, you know, it does become something that, that you can't extricate yourself from because the people probably wouldn't have talked to other people to, or to another writer. I don't know that anyone's ever taken on the subject before, but you obviously were the right person in a, a lot of the players' minds to unburden themselves and talk to about this. So I don't, I don't know how, you, I mean, I'm, I wouldn't worry too much about the narcissism. <laughs> All kinds of things fly around when you have a successful book, but if anybody yeah. says that, like, I don't really see how you could have managed this without putting yourself in the narrative as the collector of, of this, these right, right. memories. Right. And I, I, I soon had to realize that, you know, for many of the main characters in the book, were they to have written this story it would be a vastly different story. And this is my particular rendering based on my accumulation of material of what happened. But there's no sort of objective version of this story. It's, it's all highly, highly subjective. So um, you didn't really answer the question about grief and your personal experience of grief. But um, I'm going to ask an even more annoying question right now, which is sort of of the times. And I, I don't know how you're going to if, if, if it is even a question worth um, responding to, but gender, okay? Most sea stories, I don't care about this, but I think it's something I noticed when I was thinking of what I wanted to ask you. Most sea stories, and it is a huge genre and beloved genre, are by men. And white men. White, okay. Yeah. I, beards, Older men beards, with beards. Huge. Yeah. I mean, um, kind of, your, you know, your central <laughs> casting here, which is why I picked you for tonight. Well, I think so. I should have written this story. That's what I'm saying, you know? And I kind of dressed with a yachting vibe. Yeah. Um, okay, so the story, as I, the question as I wrote it was, sea stories traditionally are the province of men. Nathaniel Philbrick, Sebastian Younger, Kipling, Conrad, etc. cetera. And, and I mentioned some of those names before. But you don't write it the way those guys write it. And you're into a much more, I think that this is actually a book about the consequences of grief as much as it is an autopsy of what occurred you know, um, and you, you being a, a woman writing in a, a male-dominated um, category of writing, did that occur to you at some point as you were putting this together? Or are people, anybody saying anything about it now? Um, you know, I, I didn't give, I didn't think about it too much at the outset. Um, although I think some of the criticisms um, locally feel quite personal and maybe related to my gender, although I'll never have the experience of writing under a different pseudonym. What criticisms um, are those? Well, just that, you know, what business was it, was it to, for me to come along and tell the story and was this my story to tell? Um, and, you know, the versions that came out and there are secrets that get revealed in the book. Um, this is the PG version of what happened, by the way. I left a whole bunch of stuff out uh, that I could have put in. Um, you know, and I really wrestled for, yeah, for months with... You say that with, at one point in the book, that there are many confidences, things said to you in confidence right. that yes. you could have put in the book. Yes. And obviously you're not going to say them here. Right, they were off the record. Yep. I didn't, I wanted to know what you meant by that. Don't say what they are. <laughs> and don't say what the thing is that is in the book that's upsetting to, to people. But yeah. what are the things that you didn't put in the book that are not PG like? What are, what what are you handling here? Well, I just mean more. Um, I could have done a deeper excavation into um, into some of the stuff around infidelity and paternity and uh, and fatherhood and who knew what when and 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 those sorts of things. Um, some of them were shared with me off the record. Some were shared on the record, and I just felt that. I had to come to some kind of middle ground. Um, I think every, some people, uh, certainly I just did a talk in Montauk and they, one, one question that was a little more contentious than the others was asking, you know, is, was this just too much information? Like, did I need to know all of these things? 
And, you know, it's not as though this is a big state secret for people who were growing up in East Hampton at the, at the time. Um, this is a known story. And, and one of the girlfriends, actually, of one of the, the captain's sons, when I was getting ready to figure out, like, what goes in and what doesn't go in, she's like, oh, well, you have to put that in. Because if you don't, everyone's going to think you don't know what you're talking about. Um, and I think that's true. I, I think, you know, the, 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 the true story is, is a rich story and it's layered and it's complicated and, and all of our lives are complicated, right? And, and I love that about it. I, I, apparently not yours, David, but... Mine's going great, <laughs> yeah. Um, what, were these confidences shared with you by women exclusively? No. Or were the gruff fishermen talking like that about their own lives too? Um, both, yeah. I think one of my superpowers is getting people to talk to me and probably tell me things that they shouldn't. Um, not always, but, but meaning like, you know, this came from, well, that's from many- That's a very useful <laughs> gift as a journalist and I don't, I think you should own it. Yeah, yeah. So, um, but no, the, it, different, you know, different stories were shared with me from, from a whole cast of characters. Okay, not all of which are in the book, many of which are not in the book, but there's enough in the book that a a certain contingent of people out here and readers have found themselves upset by the book. Somehow. So I hear. Yeah, and, 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 and at the and same time I get notes from... you have some awareness from, of that. I do have some awareness of it. And at the same time, I feel like we're living in this tiny little microscope and this is obviously a moment in time. But I also get so many lovely notes from readers all over the country every day that feel like it's very empathetic and it's, it really touched them and moved them and even though they've never set foot here. So I'm gonna kind of like come out in the middle of that somewhere. Um, and this is a very personal story and I knew that going into it, you know? Um, I knew that going into it. So of the, of the four young men who you got to know by writing about them, do you think that any of them would be vexed or upset at having their stories told or would they feel that you had celebrated what, mm. what they, all, what, what their lives turned out to be, you know, ages between 20 and 30. I mean, that you took care of it, kind of. Well, one thing I like to often think about is just how, how young they all were. You know, they were 32, 23, 19, and 18. Um, and so, you know, most of them were just getting started in their lives and what would take shape and, um, you know, I, 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 yes, I think that they would be okay with it, with, with what the story that I've told. Um, I, I do. I, I also think, think that so they too. were so young. Knowing and, nothing about it, but yeah. having read the book carefully, I do, I do agree with you there. Yeah, I hope so. Um, there is um, the obvious, this book is, is, has some kind of obvious connection to um, The Perfect Storm, which I, which you must be sick of hearing and, I won't dwell on it, but um, I also, as I was reading it, th had a light bulb moment where I thought, you know, this book is really about grief and and the the ex connecting all the threads and exploring how the four lives converged on the boat. And that reminded me of another book, which I thought this book connected beautifully to, um, called The Bridge of San Luis Rey. Um, I don't know if anybody. If I could see you, I would ask you to raise hands, anybody who recognizes and has read that book. It's a fantastic book from 1927. It's a great, I mean, you, you, lots of you know about it, that won the um, Pulitzer Prize and is by Thornton Wilder, yeah. right? And yeah. he's now much better remembered for our town, but Bridge of San Luis Rey is one of the great American um, novels. And it's the exploration in the narrative voice of a Franciscan priest who witnesses a rope bridge in colonial Peru collapse, which had five people on it at, at, a time, at the time. And he explores whether it was the hand of God that brought them all together or what he's determined to sort of figure out whether it was just coincidence or if the deaths were all part of a larger design. Um, and your book reminded me of that book. And when I mentioned this to you, you reacted with excitement that I had recognized the connection and, and you brought it. And I brought today. it with me tonight. Yeah. yeah, I love this book. If you haven't read this book, you should read this book. Um, actually, I, I, I discovered this book in journalism school and I was working on my senior thesis, speaking of my preoccupation with grief, which was about um, a young Juilliard student 
who, uh, there was an un she, who was murdered while she was running, and the case was unsolved. And when I was at Columbia, I started hanging around this bar, and I became friendly with a detective who had this unsolved case on his hands. And through the detective, I got to know um, the mother of this young girl, Sarah Fox, and my journalism professor at the time, uh, Bruce Porter, who I adore, um, said, you have to read this book. This is, the, this is you're, you're telling the story of who this woman was based on her survivors. Um, and I just want to read you the last line because it's just stunningly beautiful. And I was going to memorize it, but I'm a little bit nervous, so I'm just going to read it. Um, but soon we shall die, and all memory of those five will have left the earth, and we ourselves shall be loved for a while and forgotten. But the love will have been enough. All those impulses of love return to the love that made them. Even memory is not necessary for love. And this is the last line, which is amazing. This is a, there is a land of the living and a land of the dead, and the bridge is love, the only survival, the only meaning. I mean, could that be a better? Couldn't be more ending? beautiful. Yeah. And I, I think the whole book really couldn't be more beautiful. But one of the reasons that it's fascinating is the people are from all completely different walks of life. There's an aristocrat who's been disfigured by smallpox and there's you know there's the franciscan friar's voice there's um um the diversity of of uh people is something that also occurs in your book and it reminded me of of one of the beautiful walter lord is another great writer walter lord wrote a night to remember which is the book about the titanic that was written in 1956 and we have the knowledge that we have of the Titanic because he did that in the last sort of decade or two where there were enough survivors around that he could interview them personally. And um, he opens in the introduction and says that the, the Titanic is not just about the loss of the machinery and the, the, you know, the incredible coincidence that it was the maiden voyage and all of this stuff. He said it really is about the last night of a small town. And when you explain things that happen at sea or on a bridge because people are only on them for a moment. And these boys were only together, you know, and, uh, for the time. They, and one of them who's in the story, whose family I know out here was supposed to be on the boat, but was on a surfing vacation. Um, Tom McGivern. Tom McGivern. Yeah. 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 And when you, you um, brought to life some great East Hampton characters, um, as I was reading it, one of them was his father, Judge McGivern, who as a, as a little kid, I knew out here with very imposing um, retired judge from New York who you sort of, I never knew anything about him other than that he went to the beach to read the paper at five o'clock in a safari jacket. Very gruff, cool, old guy. But apparently he, he was a great storyteller and Ed Koch eulogized him yes. at his funeral. Total legendary you know, I couldn't guy. get two words out of him, so I wouldn't have known that except for your book. But. Morgan told me this great story. Morgan is his son, who many of whose uh, beautiful photographs are in the book. And he said that his father on the weekends would sort of mow the lawn for three minutes. And then he would go inside and read some Churchill and then go back to the lawn and back to Churchill and back to, it's just such a character. So yes, I wish I had gotten to interview him. And speaking of, just back to San Luis Rey for one moment, I think that there was a little bit of a faded quality about this, this foursome on this boat, you know, and, and the kind of mystery of, of why it went down and why he had to choose this particular vessel. And, you know, the, 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 the crazy how, how storm that they faded? were caught in. Well, Mary, who's incredibly, Mary Stedman, who's incredibly intuitive, um, you know, her husband was sitting in their, in their living room and saw this boat in an advertisement, and he was like, this is the boat. This is the boat I need to have. And from that very moment... She begged him not... She begged him not to get the boat. To buy it. The boat at the time um, was a party boat that had been created in Captree, Long Island, and at the time it was down in Galveston, Texas, and she's like, are you kidding me? Why are you going all the way to Texas when there's dozens of, you know, thousands of boats on Long Island to go and get? Um, and that there was just something about this vessel that he had to have... Um, and that in looking back, you know, Mary believes that, that before we die, um, if you're paying very close attention or maybe in retrospect, that you'll see sort of a series of clues leading up to that person's death. Um, and there were certainly several red flags uh, leading up to, to that last voyage. The um, wreck is still down there. And it's known by certain fishermen where it is because they tear their nets on it. Um, and 
but not, never has been explored or photographed or anything like that. Do you want no. them to, to find it and know where it is? Well, it's so funny you ask me that because a few weeks ago, a young man uh, based in Amagansett is a shipwreck obsessive. Uh, going back several centuries, he and a group go out diving. Um, and now they, they would like to do a dive later this summer and see if they can go down. And uh, they believe they know where the coordinates are. And, and I've obviously asked if I can accompany them. So, but how voyage. do you really feel about that? Well, I think it would be fascinating to know exactly where it was. I think on some level... There still is, you know, the the, the last. I'm a little surprised to hear you say that. I mean, with your my preoccupation accept, with grief. <laughs> well, no, um, your acceptance of um, the the unanswerable questions and the mystery aspects of this. Um, I just think there's something more poetic about the th them disappearing than if we can find a metal hull and photograph it. I mean, I'm, you know, this, it doesn't matter what anybody thinks, whatever's going to happen, if they're going to find it, they're going to find it. Right. But I, I guess I'm just saying I'm surprised that you would want to be um, so closely... Um, oh, I just think it would be, given that I've spent so many years of my life you know. thinking about it, um, I just think it would be interesting if they were able to actually identify the whole, all of these years and decades later. Um, but I hear what you're saying. I mean, there, so Scott Clark, who was the, the fourth I crew think member, now they will because this is going to be yeah, in people's heads. Interesting. Um, you know, the, the, the lack of closure in this story, the, the lack, you know, the disappearance aspect just cannot be overstated and what that would do to the survivors and how, how just horrendous that would be in terms of dealing with that. Um, you know, Scott Clark, who was the fourth crew member about whom the least I knew because he was very, very new here and I couldn't, you know, track down, um, his, his mother had already passed away and his father had long since been out of the picture. Um, and I only really got to know him through a first cousin. Um, and you know, his mother went to her grave believing that her son was still out there and he, they had, you know, they were a shipwreck and he, and, and she worked for TWA and she would use all of her free airline miles to put up signs for him all over the world. Um, and that just really haunts me. And when I, I, you find yeah. the wreck, that goes away, though. And there's something so moving about that, which I also found in the passage that I read when... when um, about Catherine. Um, yeah. Catherine yeah. forgot. I mean, she, that she just couldn't really believe that he was actually dead. When people disappear, you can allow yourself that. The magical thinking takes over. Yeah, truly. Um, I want to um, open up... The, to some questions from the audience. Perfect timing. Um, and I want to do two things. I want to ask you one last question, which is, this has been very successful. I mean, look look at your packed house of beautiful people oh interested in the book. But um, I know it is doing very well. Is there interest in a movie that you've heard about? Because this has movie stamped all over it to me. There has been some interest. Um, and I still have the option. I haven't I haven't given away the option yet, and I'm in active conversations with people, whether it will be a film or a limited series or none of the above. Um, I don't know yet, but I'm eager to think of this story in another medium. I've, lo I've long seen it as a moving picture. Um, yes, the answer to that is yes. Um, we're going to conclude by saying their names, the four, the four young men. Mike Stedman. Dave Connick, Michael Vigilant, Scott Clark. Thanks. Okay, so if anybody has questions, I'm going to call on you, and someone has a microphone who will bring it. Um, the gentleman, I'm sorry I made you the longest walk, but the, <laughs> the gentleman front stage left. Hi, Amanda. It was a fantastic book. Thank um, you. I, too, couldn't wrap my arms around um, Captain Mike going all the way to Galveston, Texas, and I know Mary's reaction to it. Um, the tight-knit Montauk fishing community, were they all basically saying, why, why are you going so far? Like, I mean, how was there a serious lobbying effort to say, don't do it? You know, that's interesting. Um, thank you for that question. Um, I, I don't believe so. Uh, I think afterwards, 
um, you know, he got he went down a Christ, just the day after Christmas, and there was about a month long voyage that was sort of plagued with different technical difficulties to bring the boat back up to Montauk. So this was in January of '84, and the boat went down in March of '84. So it wasn't here for a very long time, and I think it wasn't until the boat actually came out to Montauk, and his, you know, the members of the fleet were able to see it up close and personal. Um, and feel like what you know what the heck how does it thinking. get from Galveston to Montauk did they sail it they yes yeah it steamed up the, the Atlantic coast um, and I think you know I, I think oftentimes when there's a young man chasing a dream a lot of a lot of folks felt though as though they might have they should have probably said something more forcefully um, and they didn't but it, you know this was sort of the, the golden era of tile fishing and there were a bunch of young guys retrofitting all sorts of different vessels to go off and do this work which was very very lucrative so it wasn't as though he was the only one partaking in you know not the most of seaworthy vessels um, he certainly was not alone yes we have a question on the center aisle about the middle Oh, thank you. Um, hauntingly beautiful book. I'm just making everyone read it so, I, because I want to talk to people about it. But um, we're younger than the Connicks, but we shared a law firm and obviously the club. David's, David has always haunted me because growing up, I'm just sorry, we saw, in your story, we sort of meet him as a teenager. Uh, growing up, each year, uh, uh, the teacher, I, was it St. Bernard's or St. David's, would, would say to Pete, oh, we're going to set him on fire. This year, we are going to set him on fire. And it like never happened. And, and, and as time went on, I thought the child probably had learning disabilities that maybe were never dealt with. And so he never quite, he always had this sort of sadness that he wasn't as a young, even as a, you know, a young boy in grade school, you know, living up to what the parents were expecting of him academically. But back then, I, I don't think schools, teachers, people were as aware of this sort of a learning disability and how that can damage a child if he doesn't realize what's wrong with him. And I wonder if that came up in any of your, as to why he has so much, um, not antipathy towards school, but wanted to get out of there, get out of choke, get out of. Yeah, yeah, right. Thank you for your question. Um, you know, I think Dave Dave was certainly a thrill a thrill seeker and um, and did not excel in the classroom, probably for a very many number of reasons, which you've just uh, enumerated. Um, and there is a sadness there, right? That he wasn't there wasn't a different type of an intervention, or had he come of age, you know, now, let's say, um, there would have been a whole different awareness of that. Um, but according to you know his his girlfriend at the time and lots of friends, I think even though he wasn't you know a, a, a star in the classroom or an academic by any stretch of the imagination, I think he he found a real sort of shallowness in in kind of this affluent way of being and and from a very early age really like nothing you know displeased him more than seeing tennis whites, um, and. You know, I don't know where that came from, right? Because I'll never get to have the opportunity to ask him that myself. Um, but th there's another version that a friend shared with me, which is that obviously this is a tragedy. These four young men died on a boat. Um, but would have would have actually been more, more of a tragedy would have been if Mike Steadman and Dave Connick had become stockbrokers or you know corporate litigators, and they actually you know died doing the thing they loved most in the world. And um, there's a real courageous, courageousness in that, I think. Um, and Dave was a free spirit, so um, I would have definitely have had a huge unrequited crush on him, just to say. <laughs> what a cutie pie. Um, we have a question, the gentleman to um, my right. Come on, toss it. Uh, thank you. First of all, congratulations on a uh, extremely well-researched book. Uh, I knew Mike. My sister was Mary's best friend, Susan Corsi. And uh, the one observation I have, I worked with uh, Mary once on this story about 15 years ago or so, uh, when the um, monument was put up at uh, Montauk Point. And I enjoyed the book, but I must say that the secret 
that exists at the end, and I won't spoil it for the folks who are here, was not well known to anyone who I know, including my sister, or her two kids, who were best friends of uh, Shane and Chris. And frankly, as I finished the book, I just wondered how important it was to include that information, because it didn't shed any light that I could see on the arc of the story. It didn't shed any light on Mike, who denied or told no one about what he knew about that secret. And although we're a local audience, and as you say, people across the country will not take that to heart, if there are folks here who find some criticism about that, I think that you would understand their position. Of course, and thank you for that question. Um, you know, it's, it's, a tough, it's a tough one. Um, I actually happen to think that the story is largely a story of fathers and sons and paternity and um, a search for identity. All four of these young men were doing that on that boat. And what's so interesting about grief, especially to me at least, is how each of these survivors had to reconcile the version of life that keeps being lived, that, that neither Mike nor Dave nor Michael nor Scott ever got to experience because they've been gone since 1984. But for these survivors, these, these secrets, again, this, you know, I could have exposed so many other secrets, but this sort of layer of, of, of paternity and, and fatherhood and who did what and who belonged to who um, was actually a hugely complicated part of the grief process for the survivors because they were grieving all of these, you know, not just the loss of, say, for Chris, for his father, but what, what did his father know? Um, and, and, and why did his mother do these things? Um, which, you know, I'll never really know the answer to that. Um, but so, but that's so, why I, I included them in the book, because it is as much about the survivors as it is about the, the four men who were lost at sea. But again, it feels like such a tacked-on, gratuitous piece that doesn't really fit into the narrative that you've set out. For instance, you talk about when they were first getting married. Um, Mary was pregnant, and they go into the city, and they have an abortion. You don't mention whether or not that was Mike's kid. I assume it was Mike's kid, but you don't explain why Mike wanted her to have an abortion before they got married. And then that sets off a chain of events where Mary perhaps goes out and has revenge issues that produces other children. These things don't have a heck of a lot to do with four guys getting on a boat and going off and being lost at sea, or even the sociological implications of 1984 versus 2021. They are bits and pieces of information that don't really add to the story, but cause a lot of people a lot of turmoil. I, I absolutely understand that, and I guess I just have to say that I respectfully disagree. Um, that as the writer of the story, having wrestled with all of these issues for so many years, having interviewed so many people, asking lots of difficult questions, I felt there needed to be a fullness, a, a reckoning of, of the, the wholeness of the truth of this story. Um, and that's obviously my personal opinion that not everyone agrees with. But, but thank you for the question. Sure. I can't help you very much with that question, which is going to keep coming up, but I know you're prepared for it. But I would just add as the moderator that you made that call as the writer. You are in control of the story that you want to tell, and you stand by it. That's my takeaway about that. Um, so we have one more, and then there's going to be a, a book signing in the lobby that we can... Anybody want to go on top of that one? <laughs> You, sir, very brave. Blue shirt on the aisle. Hi. Um, Uh-oh, <clears throat> he's familiar to me. Uh, yeah, I'm Barry Rabeck, and uh, I am actually a survivor of Mahoneyville. <laughs> and, and actually, I, in some sense, was perhaps a surrogate 
father or certainly older brother, because Dennis Mahoney, who remains one of my very closest friends, was the older Mahoney brother, and he had lost his father. So your theme of fatherhood, it very much ran through Mahoneyville, because I, when I was there, I lost my mother just at the same year that Dennis had lost his father. But I also lost my father, in a sense, because he married very quickly thereafter. So I would say to you that um, I think you let us off very easy in your depiction of Mahoneyville, so I'm happy about that. Because <laughs> it, uh, it was a pretty wild place. And rather remarkable that uh, I don't ever, and that it could have happened, I might have missed it, but I don't ever remember a policeman arriving there, and I can't quite... <laughs> No, why? Other than some people, I guess, had pretty good connections. But um, so the the only so that really it's not a, a real question about why you let us off so easy. But I was was happy with that, and and I do still have the paperback. I could do some <laughs> uh, extra reporting. Uh, you could probably write a, a follow up called Mahoneyville, and there's definitely enough material there for several books. <laughs> And they could be, they could be uh, salacious, and, and there's nothing anyone can do about it. You might be in trouble when the movie gets made. <laughs> I think well, I'd, there's going to be a piece. whole... I'd want a piece. Barry, we'll have to talk afterwards. I'm happy Thank to uh, make a deal. Thank you. Um, thanks, everybody, so much for coming. And um, thank you, Amanda. Thank you, David. Thank so you. Lovely to Thank that you. Was so